Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. In this video I will give you a full guide on implementing a local database in Android using the Room library. And if you've been following my channel for quite a while now then you will know that I use Room in pretty much all of my projects where I use a local database and I still notice that I don't have a guide that is fully dedicated to, to this library which is so prominent if you're an Android developer. In this video, I will give you, as a beginner for the Room Library, a full guide on how you can build such a contact list app. It's a very simple app, but it teaches you the basics of the Room Library, uh, so just a beginner guide. Uh, we will save contacts with a first and a last name and a, and a phone number, and we will then be able to order based on these three values. So we can order by first name, which is currently selected. We can order by a last name. You can see it switches, and we can order by phone number, which is then, uh, yeah, in this case, does not change anything. And all this ordering in this case is not done manually with a simple sorted by function. No, we actually order this directly with an SQL query. So you can also learn how to do that with Room. And of course, you will also be able to add a contact by clicking on this floating action button. Then a little dialog will show up. We can enter a first name, something like James, for example, James Smith. And we enter some kind of phone number. I have no idea if that exists. I hope not. <laughs> we, we click add contact. And there it is, it is added in real time. So you can also learn how you can directly observe these changes in your database. And then you will also see different ways of sorting depending on what we select here. And as you probably also um, noticed, we do have these trash cans here. And if we click them, we obviously delete an existing contact in our contact list app. If we then decide to close this app and relaunch it, then well, it's a local database, so we still get our entries, which is exactly what we want. So that is what you will learn. Let's dive right into it, into an empty Android Studio project. And the first thing you need to make sure to be able to follow through this video is you need to add the dependencies in your build.gradle app file to be able to use Room. So you can see we define the Room version. Um, I think as for now, that is the latest version that is supported. And then we need this line for the Room KTX import with that corresponding version. And we need this capped import, which stands for Kotlin Annotation Processing. Um, for, for the Room library, we use annotations a lot to define or to mark different classes, for example, as a database table or as a, as a database class. And Room will then process these annotations for us. So we really only need to define a minimum amount of code. To be able to use this Kotlin annotation processing, you also need to make sure to scroll up and add this ID Kotlin cap, otherwise Gradle won't find it. After that, make sure to synchronize that and we can jump right into coding. So when it comes to creating a database or working with databases, we usually need three different things, especially when we work with a room. On the one hand, we just need a database. So something that holds one or multiple tables. One table could be something like in this case, a contact. So the table will contain multiple rows, as many as, as you can, as you have storage on your phone, basically. Um, and every single row will correspond to one single contact in this case. And then in addition, we will have multiple columns because it's in the end a table. Each column will be one field of one row. So one field in our case of a contact, one field would be, for example, the first name, one field would be the last name, one field would be our phone number. And we can actually also inspect that directly in our studio, how our room database looks like. So I still have my app open here. And if we now go to app inspection on the bottom here and select a process, in this case, my emulator, and we choose this room guide, then wait a little moment and it will load this database inspector. And you can see here is my contact table. If we double click on that, here we see our actual database. So we have a bunch of columns, in this case an ID, which is a unique identifier for um, a specific contact in this case. We have a first name, last name and phone number, and every single row will now correspond to one instance of such a contact. So this whole thing here would be the database, then the database consists of multiple tables, in our case, just a single table to keep it simple, but you could also connect different tables. For example, if every single contact of your app um, would be able to have one or many addresses, so for example, a home address and a work address, then we couldn't really easily model this with a single table since you could have theoretically an infinite number of addresses. In that case, we would make it a different table to have a, yeah, a separate address table in which we can store addresses. And then we can link our two tables. So the contact table and an address table to say, hey, 
each contact has many addresses. So that will be the purpose of having a table in a database. Um, so that is uh, the, the second thing we actually have for databases, that we have a whole database that hosts multiple tables and each table which um, hosts multiple fields for a specific um, type of object, in this case a contact. And we need a third thing, um, especially for room, which is the so-called DAO. That stands for Data Access Object. And it's basically an interface in Kotlin where we define how we want to be able to interact with our database. So that is the place where we define, hey, we want to be able to add contacts. We want to be able to, to get contacts ordered by first name. We want to get contacts ordered by last name. All these kinds of queries and functions we want to um, use with our database, we will define in the so-called DAO object. And with these three things we will implement in this video, we have a fully functional database in Android. So let's actually jump into coding. Uh, I'm sure you're already excited, and but I, I still think it's important to understand the theory before jumping into practice first. So the first thing is we want to start creating our table. In our root package, we will create a new class called contact. And that will be a data class in which we just define the fields each contact should have. So on the one hand, of course, the first name, which is a string, the last name, which is a string, and the phone number which we also store as a string. And as I also already said, each single table in a database needs to have a so-called primary key, a unique identifier we, we can use to say, okay, we want to find the contact with the ID one. And we, we want to be sure that there is exactly one single contact with that given ID. And to define that, we want to say val ID, and we can choose a simple integer ID here. You can also choose different types, also string IDs. You just need to make sure that they are unique. Um, for integer IDs, we have the advantage that Room can automatically generate them, so they, it will just increment them when we insert more contacts. But we need to tell Room that this is our primary key, because right now it's just a plain data class, and Room doesn't know that. So we need to add an annotation, primary key, and that will tell Room, hey, please use this ID as our primary key. In case you don't want room to auto-generate this primary key, you can also set auto-generate to um, false here. And I'm noticing that it is already set to false by default, so let's set it to true instead to make sure that room will auto-generate this. And I still think we need to actually um, assign a default value here for which we can simply choose null. Um, if we add a contact and we leave this at null, then room will, yeah, just generate a random or a unique ID for this contact. And I think we should also be able to make it, make it non-nullable and set it to zero initially. Let's just try that. Um, since it's a default parameter, I'll move it to the end. And something we need is we need to annotate this with entity. An entity is basically the same as a table in room and that will already be fine. We have some options we could specify here. We could change the table name, which defaults to the class name. So we don't need to change that. Um, and we could do a lot more. We could define foreign keys, primary keys, if we would have multiple, but that is more advanced uh, database stuff. We don't want to deal with that here. And then the next step is to go to our root package again. And now I want to create our DAO or data access object for this table. So I want to have a contact DAO, which is an interface. And again, to tell room that this is our data access object, um, or one of these, you can actually have multiple DAOs. I want to annotate this simply with DAO. And then here now go all the functions we want uh, or we need to be able to modify our contacts table. On the one hand, that is a function to save a contact or to simply insert a contact to yeah, phrase it in database language. Here we then need to pass the type of entity we want to insert, which is simply a contact. And then we actually don't need to write the implementation of this since that is what the annotation processor will do for us. And then to tell room that this is our insertion function, we can annotate this with either insert, which will simply yeah, insert a new value, or something that is quite new to room is the absurd annotation. So absurd is a mix of updating and inserting. So if there is already a contact, with the ID of the contact we passed here in the database, then it will instead update the existing one. If we use insert instead, then 
it will simply insert a new one and it will complain if there is already an, an, a contact in the database with that given ID. However, we can also specify a so-called on conflict strategy here. Um, so if there is a conflict, if we insert a contact with an ID that exists in our database already, uh, then we can say, okay, what should it do? The default is abort. So it will simply probably throw an exception. I'm not sure here, but you can also set it to ignore, to simply don't do anything. You can set it to replace, which is then the equivalent to upsorting. Um, but since we have this new annotation in room, let's just use this to upsort a new contact. And we can also name the function like that, upsort contact. So it inserts if it doesn't exist, and if it exists, it will replace it. Then the next easy function we can implement here is a function to delete a contact, which you can pass here. And that is also super easy with room. We just need to annotate it with at delete. And one thing about these two types of functions where we simply do something and we don't really get some type of data here. So we don't really um, query for context. We can make both these functions suspend functions in Kotlin. So they will actually um, run in a coroutine and yeah, just block it until that database operation finished. So I'd always use that in case you stick to using coroutines for asynchronous programming or yeah, just flows. Now coming to defining our queries because we want to have three different ways of querying um, context from this table. On the one hand, a query that gives us our contacts ordered by first name, ordered by last name, and ordered by phone number. So we need three more functions, and that will be a plain function, a get contacts ordered by first name is the first one. And what will this now return? Well, with room, we have different options here. We could simply return a list of type contact. So it will simply give us all the contacts we um, have in our database, ordered by first name. But the cool thing about room is that it actually is able to give us observables. So things you can observe and things that notify you as soon as there is a change in the table. And that is the true power about room. So what we can do here is we can simply say we want to get a flow of type list of contact. And a flow is such a data type or data structure that will notify us about changes whenever there is a certain change in this table. So whenever we insert a new contact, for example, then this flow that we already got will emit a new list of contacts that includes the newly added contact. And the same also works with a live data. I'm not sure if I can use that here. Yes, um, I don't need the, the dependency. Um, so if you're using live data, you can also get that here. Uh, and I think there might also be something for RxJava, but that is a little bit more old school. I like using flows. And one more thing we need to do here is to define the query for room. Because right now, just from this function name, room doesn't know how it should get these, uh, first, uh, these contacts ordered by first name. So we want to add a query here, query annotation. And in here, we can just define our SQL query, how we want to get these contacts. So we want to select everything from our contact table and we order these by the first name field and the order should be ascending which is the default but let's specify it um, still and that is everything we need to do to get this function because room will yeah just make sure uh, that the implementation of this will be generated behind the scenes for us so we don't need to run that on our own we now want to copy this paste it two more times once for the last name and once for the phone number. And we just need to change this to last name and this to phone number like this. And then we have a fully functional DAO. And the last step to have um, a database, a functional database is to define that actual database. So we now just need something where we tell Room how it should um, connect all these pieces we now implemented. So um, we need to tell Room, hey, these are all of our tables we have in our database. Um, these are all of our DAOs. And we need to create a new class for that. So in our root package, we're going to create a new file called uh, contact database in this case. Select class here. And this is actually an abstract class which needs to inherit from Room database like this. In this abstract class, we can now define our abstract vowels for all of our DAOs. In our case, we only have one. So we say DAO 
of type contact DAO. And since it's abstract, we don't need to implement it since again, Room will do this for us. But something we need to tell Room is that this is our database class. And we do this by adding an annotation again, add database. And here we on the one hand need to specify our entities so our different tables as a list. And since we only have one entity, which is our contact entity, we need to specify that here with contact double colon class. And we need to specify a version. The version is needed to tell Room when there is a certain update to our database, um, how it should actually migrate the old data to the new data. We don't need to deal with that here. I have a separate video about migrations. So if you reach that point, um, feel free to check that out. But we are fine right here. And that is already the database logic that you need to be able to just use your database with the given functions here. Of course, we still need to build our UI, which is the larger part of this video, um, because I think it still helps to, to implement this once with a fully functional app that does something. But we already finished implementing our database. We now just need to yeah, call the corresponding functions when we want to do that. So when we click the um, add button, for example, to upset a new contact, we want to first of all, go to our root package, and I want to create something like a contact event that will be a sealed interface. And to be exact, this class will basically just contain different events, an event would be something basically a user action. So something the user does on our screen, for example, clicking on the floating action button, for example, clicking on um, deleting and contacts or clicking on the trash can. So basically any type of user action that is possible on our contact screen will be represented by one event here. That's just a very handy way to handle these user interactions in our view model later on. So on the one hand, when I have an object to save a contact. So that will simply save the contact where we use the um, data the user entered in the text fields and that will be a contact event. It doesn't need any parameters since we already know everything we need to know. We then want to have a data class when the um, to, to set the first name. So when the first name changes, we pass this here. So when the user types something in the first name field, contact event, can duplicate that two more times to have the same for the last name last name and of course for setting a phone number as well like this whoops we then want to have an object to show our dialogue and we want to have an object to hide our dialogue so the dialogue is used to add a new contact we also want to have a data class to um, sort contacts which will um, where we will pass a sort type and that is an enum class we need to create um, so let's do that here in our root package new class called sort type select enum class and this will basically just contain the different types um, or the different fields we can sort based on on the one hand we have a first name we have a last name and we have the phone number just like that that's already it we can then go back here, pass the sort type and implement contact event again. And finally, you want to have a data class to delete a contact when we click on the trash can, where we pass the contact we clicked on, like this. Next up, we want to create a little state class. So just a class that combines our screen state. So that includes our contacts list that is currently displayed. That includes the currently selected radio button for the sorting. Um, that includes whether we want to show or hide the dialog and things like that. So in our root package, new class called contact state, make that a data class. And here we put in all these fields. On the one hand, our contact list. So a list of contacts, which is, yeah, the, the default um, is an empty list. We want to have the first name. So um, the text of uh, the first name text field and the dialog. We want to have the same for the last name. Same for the phone number. And we want to have a val is adding contact. So if the user is currently adding a new contact to show the dialog, which is also default, um, which, which defaults to false. And finally, you want to have the current sort type. So uh, yeah, that will be used to decide which radio button is switched on. The default sort type is first name. Sort type is not first name like this. And now since we have our state, we have our events, we can now implement our view model in which we will map all of our states. So new class contact view 
model, oops, view model, select class, make that inherit from view model. And here we simply want to pass our DAO in the constructor. So simply contact DAO and this view model will simply host our state. So that will be a private val underscore state, which is a mutable state flow. I like to use state flow here. Uh, feel free to also use compose state or so, where we will just have an uh, empty contact state. We also need a private val for our um, sort type, which we selected. And I know I passed this in the contact state, but you will, um, you will learn in the next few minutes why I make that a separate field, which is also a separate mutable state flow with the sort type first name by default. And we wanna have another private val for our contacts. So the currently displayed contacts, which is a mutable state flow. Oh no, this is actually not a mutable state flow. Let's leave that for now and we'll implement that in a moment after we implemented our on event function. So as soon as there is some kind of user interaction, if the user presses a button, type something in a text field or so, we will trigger this function with a corresponding event. For example, showing the dialog, if we um, tap on the floating action button to change the phone number, if the user types something there and things like that. So in here, we'll just have a big one expression. Depending on what the event is, we can press Alt Enter to add the remaining branches. And now for each single case, we can handle that very um, easily here in the view model. When we want to delete a contact, what do we want to do? We want to call our DAO and say that delete contact. And the contact we delete is passed to our event. You'll notice we get an error here because we need to execute that in a coroutine since that is a suspend function. So what we can do is we can launch a coroutine in view model scope, view model scope that launch, put that in here and we won't have any errors anymore. And then if we want to hide our contact dialog, we want to say underscore state that update to update that state. And we only want to update our um, dialog. So is adding, is adding contact is false. So we're not adding the contact anymore if you want to hide it. And yeah, that will simply leave the remaining fields unchanged. Um, it will just change the single field we modify here. Then for saving a contact, that is probably the most complex function or the most complex case here for our when expression. Here, we first of all want to get a reference to the first name of our state, which is state at value. Um, oh, we don't have that yet. Let's choose, um, no, let's leave that empty for now and um, implement that at the end. Let's implement the easier functions for now. Set first name is easy, state, update, hit copy, and the first name text is simply event, that first name. We can then copy this and do the same for setting the last name and setting the phone number. So here we pass last name, here we pass last name, and here we say our phone number is event.phone number. When, when we show a dialog, we can actually also paste this here. We can say is adding contact. In this case is true. If we want to show the dialog, of course. And when we want to sort the contacts, we want to say state, um, actually not state, we just want to say underscore sort type dot value is equal to event that sort type. So we just update our sort type mutable state flow. So now only our safe contact case is left and we need to implement our real state. So right now that's only the mutable state, but we, we only want to expose immutable states to our UI since the UI shouldn't really um, be able to directly manipulate states of our view model. So since for our contact DAO, for each single um, sort type we have your first name, last name and phone number, we return a different flow from our database. Um, it, it's quite tricky to make that work um, and combine that to a single state in our contact view model. That is now a bit more advanced flow stuff. And I do have a playlist about flow operators and uh, stuff like that. So feel free to watch that in case that is new to you. I will of course do my best to explain this here what I do. So what we will have is we will have a private val underscore contacts for our context state which um, just ho always holds the, the current context um, that considers our sort type. So we will say we have our sort type and we then say that flat map latest where we get access to this sort type. And depending on what that sort type is, we will have one expression, 
alt enter to add these remaining branches. If it is this um, first name sort type, we map this to a DAO get context ordered by first name. If it's last name, DAO ordered by last name, or a DAO dot ordered by phone number. And the reason we do this is um, flat map latest, if we um, check the documentation here, it will basically take a flow, which is our sort type. And whenever that flow changes, so whenever our, our sort type changes, whenever we tap a new radio button, we transform that emission, so the new sort type, to a new flow. And that new flow is, in this case, one of these flows that comes from our database. So with that, we basically achieve some sort of reactivity that as soon as our sort type changes, we will automatically also change the source where we get these contacts from. I hope that makes sense. We still need to say um, start state in to save that in a state flow to make it state, so to, to cache it in this flow. And we want to state in view model scope. We say sharing started while subscribed. So um, this piece of code is only executed if there is an active subscriber to the state flow. And we then say the default value is simply an empty list of contacts. And then we don't have any issues anymore. We get a warning since that's a bit experimental, I think. We can hit Alt Enter to add this annotation um, to our view model. And then the warning will go away. Now this oops, um, is a state flow of, of lists of contacts, um, which always holds the context with the currently um, used sort type. So as soon as we now change the sort type here, this will automatically trigger a change for this context list and it will automatically map this uh, the sort type to the correct order and finally the list of contacts. Hope that makes sense. We can now go ahead and do something a little bit similar um, with our state. So that will be the public version of our state that we expose to our UI, that our UI will observe. And that is equal to combine, to combine multiple flows into one. On the one hand, we want to combine our state. We want to combine our sort type and our contacts. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, let's say, oops, uh, state, sort type and contacts. And we then say state.copy Context is context, sort type is sort type, and we again say that state in has five seconds here. Don't worry, I will explain all that. And the default value is contact state. So what the heck happens here? With combine, as I said, we can combine these three flows into just one flow. So as soon as any of these state flows emits a new value, this piece of code will be executed. So if there is a change in sort type, we, um, we update the sort type of our context state correspondingly here. If there is a change of our context, so if the sort type changes, for example, which changes the context, then we will also update the context in our, in our screen state as well. And of course, if there is a change in our state, this will also um, be executed. And the reason we add these five seconds here and not here is um, that this is a flow that is directly consumed or observed in the UI. And this just makes sure that there is a certain bug we, can, we um, can't have when this flow would emit a value when the activity is directly in the undestroyed state where it actually shouldn't get value. So it's a quite complex bug, um, but this is something we we can use to make sure we don't have that bug. I don't want to dive deep into this here. Um, I covered that in another video. And now that we have our final state, we can also implement our save contact function before we jump to implementing our actual UI to display all that. Here we first of all want to get the first name of our state. So the text field value we want to get the last name like this. We want to get the phone number. And then we want to check if any of these are empty. Oops, phone number, of course. I want to check if any of these are empty. So if the first name is blank or the last name is blank or the phone number is blank, then we just want to return out of here and not insert anything because then we don't have any data to insert. Then we want to make sure that we create our contact we want to now insert into our database, which is a contact. First name is first name, last name is last name, 
and the phone number is the phone number and the ID will be automatically generated. And then we can say we launch a curtain in view model scope to insert that and we say DAO upsert contact and we pass the contact we want to insert. After that, we want to say da underscore state update and we update it on the one hand with is adding contact, set that to false to simply hide the dialog after we added a contact and then we reset our text fields to empty strings and phone number. So now that we have our review model, we can finally start building our UI and then we can try this out. So in our root package, let's have a contact screen, select file, make that a composable contact screen. And this will take two parameters on one hand, our state, and on the other hand, an on event lambda, which we trigger when we do a certain thing on that screen, um, which corresponds to an, a contact event like this. So what will be on this contact screen? If we take a look here, um, we will have a column um, in the end, just a lazy column for everything um, where we will have our row of radio buttons first. And then our um, that will be just be a lazy column for the contacts where we have a contact item. Um, we have a row and a column here for these two names um, and the phone number. And then we will have our floating action button. So we put everything in the scaffold. That is the plan here. So we, as I said, the outer layout will be a scaffold, which makes it easy to add a floating action button in here as a parameter. We can then, um, we get the padding values here and we can say, we use a lazy column and the padding values of this lazy column will just be, uh, it's content padding. Content padding will be padding like this. We then also want to say modifier is modifier fill max size and import modifier at enter. And we want to make sure that the vertical arrangement is arrangement um, dot spaced by to make it so that there is always 16 dp of space between each list item. We can then open this block of code here. Um, let's start to implement this floating action button up here. So we have a floating action button. When we click this, we trigger our on event lambda with our contact event dot show dialog. Since if we click on this floating action button to show our dialog to add a new contact and the content of this floating action button will be an icon, which will correspond to icons default dot add. And the content description will be add contact like this. Put that on separate lines some reason I don't get the helper function for that. Doesn't matter, let's format it like that. And then jump to our lazy column. In here, we first of all want to have a normal item, which just holds one item, which will be the row for our radio buttons. So this row will have a modifier to fill the whole width of our screen. And it will also have a horizontal scroll. Here we say, remember scroll state, so that will basically make sure that we can yeah, scroll horizontally here for our radio buttons to also be able to yeah, pick the phone number. The vertical alignment of this row should be centered. So we just center all these uh, radio buttons vertically. And in here for the row content, we just want to take our sort type that values to um, loop over all of our values, all of our different sort types and get a reference to these. And for each sort type, we now want to have another row. So that will now be a row that holds this radio button and the text next to it. So in here, our modifier will be modifier that's clickable. Because if we click on such a row that holds a radio button and a text, then we want to call, then we want to call on event with a contact event dot um, sort contacts with our sort type we clicked on. We also want to make sure that we center all these items vertically in this row. And mm, yeah, we can also import that pressing out enter. And in here we'll have a radio button. When is that radio button selected? Well, if our state that sort type is equal to the current sort type we're looping over. 
um, in on click when we click on this radio button we can also simply paste this event here so that we sort our contacts based on the um, clicked on sort type and after that radio button we will have our text which will simply say yeah let's just say sort type dot name and that is something very simple so we just display the exact name of our enum, um, enum class. Uh, that is it for our top row. The next thing would be another item in our lazy column, which will be an items block to display multiple items. Make sure to import this one here with items, um, a list of type T and pass state.contacts. So for, yeah, we will now display an item for all of our contacts and get a reference to each one here. So each contact is in the end just a row where we have a column first and then an icon button last. So let's just make that a row. Modifier is modifier fill max width. And in here, as I said, we'll have a column for our first name, last name, and then below that our phone number. Here we say modifier, modifier weight 1F. That will cause that um, this row will occupy all the space until um, the, the other item. So in this case, just the icon button and in here, we're going to have text. The text in this case is our um, contact.firstname space contact.lastname. Oops, like this. And the font size is 20SP. I'll enter to import that. And below that first name, last name text, we're going to have another text for the phone number. So contact dot phone number like this and here i set the font size to 12 sp a little bit smaller and then finally after this column inside of our row we're going to have an icon button and when we click that we're going to delete the contact we clicked on so here we say on event contact event dot delete contact and the contact we clicked on is well just our contact we can then say we have an icon for that icons default delete and the description of that is delete contact like this oops cool that is it for our contact screen the last thing that is missing is our dialog when we click on our floating action button here so in our package we can create a new file called add contact dialog select file and make that a composable add contact dialog which will take our contact state. It will take our on event function again, um, which is actually a lambda of type contact event to unit and a modifier. Like this. So in here, we want to have an alert dialog. That's actually quite simple to implement that. Um, and in here, we have on dismiss request, which is called when we tap outside of the alert dialog or dismiss it in some other way. For example, by pressing the back button, we are going to need a title, which is simply a text composable with um, add contact or so. We're going to need some text. The text can be anything here. So I will just choose a column of um, text fields in this case. Here we can say the vertical arrangement is arrangement spaced by 8dp to uh, make it so that there is 8dp of space between each single text field. And in here we can then spam our text fields basically. The first value is state um, first name, so first name text field value. And when that changes, we say on event set first name with our new value. We can also give it a, a label, um, a label or placeholder is it called? Uh, let's use a placeholder and yeah, which is basically just a hint what we need to enter and this would be first name. And then here we can copy and paste this two more times. The second one is for the last name. Set last name and the placeholder is last name. And the last one, phone number, set phone number, and phone number. And then below our text, one more thing we need is buttons. 
or just one single button in our case. Here I'm going to use a box where we say we fill the whole width of our dialog. And then inside of that box, we're going to use a button. When we click that button, we say we call our on event, contact event dot save contact. Since if we click on our um, add contact button, and then we just want to save that, of course, the text is save contact or just save. And let's also make sure we align this button to the end of our box. Content alignment is center end like this. And did we assign the modifier yet? Nope. We can also do this here. The modifier is modifier. On this miss request here, we are going to need to call on event with contact event dot height dialog in this case. And that is it. Now we only need to take this add contact dialog to our contact screen right here and check if we actually want to display that by checking if state is adding contact. And if so, we call our add contact dialog with our state and our on event function. And yeah, that is it for our UI. We of course now need to call this contact screen in our main activity. So let's switch to that. Say we have our contact screen and in here we need the state and we need our on event lambda. For that, we need our view model and for our view model, we need our database. So let's see how we can now initialize our room database. And first of all, normally I would totally use um, some form of dependency injection setup um, to have a global place where you manage your dependencies, something like a Dagger module or so. Um, but I think this would maybe overwhelm some of you if you haven't worked with Dagger yet in Android or dependency injection in general. So I will just initialize our database in here, but um, please keep in mind that this is not the, the optimal way of doing that. In case you want to learn dependency injection, then uh, please just look on my channel and search for Dagger Hilt Crash Course and you will uh, yeah, just learn why there are certain better approaches. So we're going to have a private val DB here, which I'm going to initialize with lazy. So by lazy. And in here, we will say room. So we call room again, dot database builder. We need to pass our context where we pass the application context. We need to pass the class of our database we want to initialize here, which is our contact database double colon class that Java and the name of our database file. So where we save this is just contacts.db. And then after that, we can call that build to finally build our database. Then the next thing here is our view model. We can say private val view model by view models. That is how we initialize a view model in an activity. And we say that is our contact view model. And since our view model does take a parameter, which is our DAO, we need to provide a factory. Um, that is sadly necessary if, you, if your view model has some parameters. If you use something like Dagger Hilt, you don't need to create your own factory because Dagger does that for you. Uh, but we need to do that here for the sake of simplicity. And we can just say object colon view model provider dot factory and override the create function here to return our view model instance the way we want. So we want to return a contact view model where we pass our DAO. We get that from our DB. So we simply DB, you can see that is now a contact database and we call that DAO on that. And then we can simply say ST. So we cast that as our return value here. That is just how we create a view model with parameters. Um, looks quite complex, but is really only about this line of code here. And then we can finally get our state in compose. So val state is equal to actually by view model state collect as state to just get um, that state and observe that. Then we can pass it here state and on event will be uh, view model double colon on event. We probably missed some padding on our screen, so we could also quickly add that to our contact screen by adding some padding to our outer scaffold. So modifier is modifier padding 16 dp. And that should be it, I would say. I would say we just try this out, run this on my emulator and hope for the best. So this is still my OLED, of course, 
Gradle will probably take a moment and then I'll see you back. Okay, so uh, this looks a bit weird here because of the padding in the scaffold, um, because the scaffold has a different background than our root view. Um, let's care about that later. Our radio buttons are displaying. Um, we can switch these, that is working fine. And if we now want to add a contact, that is the interesting part. Um, the dialog does not look very, uh, very beautiful, but it is hopefully a functional one. So first of all, the first name, last name, phone number, clicking save, and there it is. There is our contact in our database, because otherwise it would not even display. Let's first of all check if the um, sorting works. So we add a new contact, first and last, entering some form of phone number. Now it is ordered by first name, which is correct, because F comes be uh, before P. Um, last name should now put this one as the last, which is correct. And the phone number should put this one here as the first one, which is also correct. So that is working perfectly fine. If we rotate our device, this is hopefully working fine. Yes, it is. Oops, um, that was messed up. <laughs> um, let me quickly turn this back. Yes, um, we wrote it back. That is working fine. And if we now delete a contact, like the first last one, then that is also working fine. And if we relaunch our app, we hopefully still see our Philip contact which we do, so we now have a fully functional database in Android. To fix this little padding issue, we can uh, remove the padding here of our scaffold and move it one step below to our lazy column. Let's actually just ignore this padding here, make it unused and pass padding values of 16 dp here. This should hopefully fix this. If we relaunch this, then yeah, now that is looking perfectly fine. Cool, now we have a fully working contact list app, not a very beautiful one, but a functional one. And I would really encourage you to extend this app to keep on learning about Room. So what you could do is you could implement behavior that if you click on a contact, you actually get to a detail screen, which displays details about that contact, maybe even more details than in this list. You could also add uh, things like an address. You could add things like an email address or so. Um, so you really have a, a real contact list app. Because just watching a video in the end is great, but it does not really teach you how to do it in practice. You can only learn that by actually doing it in practice so i really encourage you to do that at home and if you feel like you need help with more advanced android projects then definitely check my android premium courses down below first link in this video's description uh, where i have a bunch of courses which will make you an industry ready android developer so thanks for watching and i'll see you back in the next video have an amazing rest of your week bye bye